Welcome back. You're watching HFO TV. Welcome back to HFO TV. I'm Greg Frick, partner here at HFO Investment Real Estate. Today we have Ted Reed, Principal Regional Planner for Metro. Thank you, Ted, for coming. Thank you for having me. We're going to talk a little bit about the Metro Urban Growth Report that's uh, been out for the last year and is now going to Council for approval and also kind of give a little background on Metro and you know what that means to you know the land use planning for this region. So again, thank you for coming. Sure. Maybe give a little background on what Metro is, the region it covers, and uh, maybe some little history then we'll kind of get into what's going on in the future. Sure. So Metro is the uh, regional government for the Portland metropolitan region. We're fairly unique in the United States. Uh, many other regions in the U.S. have a regional right. uh, government that oversees transportation planning, how federal transportation dollars are spent. We have that function, but we also have a unique function of overseeing the sort of big picture land use of how the region grows. Uh, so we coordinate with three counties, uh, Clackamas, Multnomah and Washington, as well as 25 cities uh, in our jurisdiction. And the cities all within those three counties? Yes. Okay. And uh, we are also unique in that we have a, an elected regional council uh, that has seven council members. One of those is a president elected at large, and the other six serve districts around the region. Okay. And how long has Metro been in place? Uh, we've been in place since the late 70s, and, okay. and we have a home rule charter. Uh, that was approved by voters and, and basically the, the core purpose that Metro has is to look out for uh, quality of life for, for current and future generations in the region. So preserving things like air quality, water right. quality, making sure that farms and forests outside the urban area remain intact, okay. and uh, making sure that, that investment in our downtowns and main streets continues to happen. And would there, I just out of curiosity, would there ever be a chance that another county comes into Metro as we get more, you know, development and more, you know, growth within the Portland metropolitan area with you know, Yamhill County or something like that come in? Has there ever been talk about that? I am not aware of anyone okay. discussing that. Yeah. And are there any other cities in the United States under the same kind of governmental setup that we have? I know Portland's unique too in the way their council is set up. So yeah. just. Uh, the Metropolitan Regional Council in Minneapolis is probably the closest there okay. is there. Um, uh, I'm not an expert on it, but, right. but they, they have uh, a similar uh, form of regional government okay. uh, that, that has uh, elected officials and some land use and infrastructure spending authority. Okay, so I know the, one of the big things in Metro is the urban growth boundary, which right. has been around for I think going on 40 years now or close to 50. Since 1979. Right. Yeah. Um, and that comes up every six years kind of as a, you know, looking at it, what needs to be expanded, not expanded. Right. And uh, that's due now. So maybe you can give a little background on the urban growth report in terms of, you know, what was found out, what the surprises were, and what was the recommendation the council, and we can kind of talk a little bit more specific. Sure. So this region has great quality of life. Uh, we enjoy things like the, the access to Mount Hood, access to the coast, right. and many of us uh, enjoy um, vibrant downtowns around the region where we can take care of our shopping, go to our jobs, and none of that happened by mistake. It's, it's because of decisions that were made over the last several decades. And one of those decisions, as you mentioned, was to have an urban growth boundary um, so that we have um, uh, efficient um, growth, that, that it, it makes sense where it's going. We're not uh, overextending infrastructure uh, in, in places that we're focusing our investments in those downtowns. Um, so as you mentioned, every six years, uh, Metro is responsible for looking at the question of whether there's a need to expand that urban growth boundary. The intent was always that, that it could be expanded over time if there was a demonstrated need. Um, so to, to, to determine that, we look at a population and employment forecast, okay. and we also look at, at what land already inside the urban growth boundary may be buildable for the next 20 years. Compare those two things and come up with some conclusions about whether there's a regional need to expand the urban growth boundary. And when you're looking at the vacant land, are you looking at the current zoning, or are you trying to project where zoning may be? I know the city of Portland is looking at yeah. you know, maybe a comprehensive rezone for the inner, you know, close in where we've got a lot of industrial that may go more to a, you know, general commercial, maybe as right. residential. How do you factor that in in terms of growth? Well, we know those things will will change over time, but we take basically a snapshot okay. of uh, current zoning, current policies. Uh, and we not only look at vacant land, but land that's likely to redevelop over the next 20 years. That's, that's part of the picture, too. And you're seeing a lot of right. that 
happening in, in uh, core areas of Portland recently. And where do you see um, in terms of, I mean, was there any surprises in kind of the, the statistics that you looked at for the last couple of years and putting this report together? Yeah. And then kind of an aha moment, like, hey, wow, that's, you know, kind of went against kind of the grain or what we thought we were going to find? Well, um, I, I think uh, one of the big things is, is that there are some demographic changes that are happening nationwide right. that we're trying to pay attention to. Uh, one of those is that uh, of the new households we expect over the next 20 years, uh, about two-thirds of them are expected to have one or two people in them. So that has implications for the type of housing we need to be planning for. We also have an aging population, and those two things combined uh, lead to, to somewhat lower household incomes as well, which we need to think about both in terms of how we provide housing, but also how we uh, encourage uh, the creation of middle-income jobs right. for people. And then in terms of that, you, when you're looking at the kind of lower income per household, does that mean you're, from a services standpoint, need to be closer, trying to get the, you know, the 20 minutes community or 20, where everything can be done within 20 minutes on public? That's, that's an important thing uh, the, that we try to pay attention to because transportation costs are the second biggest household cost after housing. Um, so that, that easy access to the doctor, to the grocery right. store, to your job, those are all things that, that matter in terms of uh, people's everyday budgets. And then on the study from what we've seen in the past to where we're going now is, it is the amount of, you know, quote, industrial land or retail land changing in relation to how much for single family or multifamily, just in terms of the demographic and how people live? Are we looking, you know, if I bring in this much single family, I need this much industrial land to support that? How do you guys change that or look at that? Well, so the, the population and employment forecast are linked together. We, right. you know, you would expect uh, the, those two things to, to be consistent, that, that if you're going to have a certain amount of population growth, you're, you're going to right. have a certain amount of uh, employment growth as well. Um, we do a range forecast because we know we're going to be wrong about some of those assumptions looking out 20 years, though. So we try to provide uh, our Metro Council with the ability to think about um, some of the things you've mentioned um, as they're making this decision uh, and, and think about whether it makes sense to plan for the midpoint of that range, which is our, our, our most likely outcome from a probability standpoint, right. or lower growth or higher growth. And then in looking, so it, it's not you've got all, you've gathered all your information. What, what are you guys recommending now to the council yeah. in terms of the report? It sounds like, I know we've talked about it for the last couple of years as, sure. as things have gone in. Kind of what's the, the plan looking forward? Well, there's been a lot of uh, process to date. Uh, we've had a lot of peer review of our analysis. So beginning in early 2013, we started right. convening both public and private sector, ac academic sector uh, experts, demographers, economists, planners to help us think about those two aspects, the population employment forecast and also the buildable land inventory. Um, we produced a report last um, July uh, called the Urban Growth Report, and that's the, our analysis of, of whether there's a need to expand the urban growth boundary. Um, we've, we've had a lot of discussions since the release of that report, and today our chief operating officer released a new recommendation to the Metro Council um, about the growth management decision itself. That direction um, that, that she lays out there, um, or the recommendation she lays out, is um, not to expand the urban growth boundary this, this year, that there's no need for that. There's some other factors that, that play yeah. into her reasoning as well, um, uh, but that, that's where we stand today. Uh, the Metro Council will be making that decision, though, this fall, uh, whether to expand the urban growth boundary. So then is there more uh, debate or fact-finding between now and fall again, or there's more than just digesting this report and then looking and coming back with questions to, to your group as to, okay, you know, we need to figure this out a little bit or give me, go dive a little deeper in this? Well, our hope is at this point that, that we've done a lot of, uh, all of the technical work we need to do. We're okay. pretty far down the line there that really um, this is, is uh, taking forward the direction we've gotten from the Metro Council to date uh, and beginning to put together the pieces for them to, to take an official action um, this fall. And so this, this recommendation comes, the council either you know, passes it, which is probably likely that that's the way it's going to go. It doesn't come back up again for another six years? Uh, well, the, yes, under state law, every six years, uh, the one of the recommendations that our chief operating officer uh, issued today was that 
Um, she, she recommends that the council ask us as staff to produce a new urban growth report sooner than that six year cycle. Okay. Um, because of many of the things that are changing uh, today in our, in our cities, um, you know, the, the, all of the multifamily construction that we're seeing is a new thing for this region. It's, right. it's a, it, so for us too, yeah, we, this is... Uh, right. I mean, yeah. So we want to keep our eyes on that and uh, be responsive. Uh, to, to changes that are happening quickly, have a better sense of whether uh, what we're seeing today is, is emblematic of what we're going to see for the next 20 years or if it's right. um, some sort of bizarre uh, uh, blip that, that's a consequence of the Great Recession. Um, I tend to think that, that it has a little bit more staying power than just being a blip. Um, mm -hmm. so. No, I think, I think it's more of a demographic shift. In yep. A lifestyle shift, people doing things later in life, uh, and I, you know, as we brought up with the aging population and the millennials coming in as a larger right. population, being near services, being next to, you know, cultural things, I think are more and more important. That's right. Uh, the question, if if as a city or a county says, you know, we want, you know, we don't want to go, we want to add land and we want to increase our tax base, how does that work, and what's the framework for once Metro adopts this? Is this Hey, done. This is what you guys are doing, and you're going to have to go within or you know underneath us. How does that work? Well, yes, the, the Metro Council ultimately does have decision-making authority okay. for the region's urban growth boundary. We do hear exactly what you mentioned, though. There are some cities that they want the uh, possibility of expanding uh, their their cities either now or in in future uh, growth management decisions. So. We work with those cities on an ongoing basis to understand what it is that they, they, they want for their communities okay. and, and uh, try, try to act as good partners with, with them, knowing though that, that um, there is a high bar in the state of Oregon for expanding the urban growth boundary. You have to demonstrate a regional need to do that. To, to expand it. Right, just, right. right. And, and uh, if we don't do that, we'll end up in court. Right. So. Okay. And then on in terms of the apartment construction and the you know, what we've seen in the last two years is a, an enormous amount of construction close in. Uh, we've seen, you know, I think our permits are double the high that we've seen in the last 20 years, and I would say 75% of those are in basically two submarkets close in, yeah. and then out, out west side, kind of near Intel and Nike. There's been talk on about affordability within the core. How do you address affordability within the core from a housing standpoint? Um, in, in this, you know, in this, when you're not expanding it, where we're not bringing more land in, right. Uh, you've got more barriers of entry, you know, you've got fewer sites, you know, the cost of those sites go up as, you know, things are more desirable. How do we, you know, is that something city by city, is that something Metro can kind of, hey, we need to get more affordability within the core, we're going to price out a lot of people? Right. Well, so the one word you mentioned there is, I think, important, uh, desirability of places. And so in many ways, we're victims of our own success yes. here. Uh, that we've created the kinds of communities that people want to live in. That's reflected in the prices that, that people are experiencing when they're looking for housing. So it's a real issue, um, preserving affordability. Uh, we don't believe, though, that, that adding land on the edge is a solution to that. It's really a kind of a drop in the ocean in terms of all of the housing right. that, that this region needs to provide. And so we're projecting that, that most of that new housing needs to, to be developed in our urban cores uh, that we that we have today. And you're seeing a lot of it, as you mentioned, in, in a few locations, in close in Portland, and then also uh, out in Hillsboro. Right. We're seeing a, a fair amount of that in, in uh, uh, Orenco and Tannisborn. Uh, we're also seeing a fair amount of housing production down in Wilsonville. Yes. Yeah. So would that go back to the cities then, in terms of the affordability component? That, hey, this is what you've got to work with. You know, city of Portland, you've got a concern about affordability within, let's just, you know, northwest Portland. Yeah. You know, that's not going to be coming from Metro. That's going to be coming to the city. If you want to grant, you know, it's, SDC re reductions, tax credits, things like that, that's really not... There's no sir, silver bullet on right. affordability. It's something that, that cities, regions around the country are grappling with, particularly the ones that are successful in revitalizing their downtowns. Uh, so Metro does have uh, an equitable housing uh, initiative that we've got that we've begun uh, that is seeking to find um, sort of best practice solutions to affordability. But okay. it's it's going to require action not just by Metro, but as you mentioned, cities by nonprofits. It's going to require that we uh, invest strategically in, in transportation facilities, transit service. Right. Um, so all of us need to be working together on this one. And then I have a question just kind of out of, in terms of Metro just being for Oregon, 
How do you factor in Clark County and, and Vancouver being it's right across the river? Uh, you know, there is a predominantly large population that lives there and works here and vice versa. Right. How do you factor that into your projections for growth and where you're going to see housing? Is it just kind of, you recognize they're there, they're really not part of the report, but you have to figure in they're going to have an effect on the report? Well, they're definitely part of our economic region. As you right. mentioned, people live in Clark County and, and work in, in our region and vice versa. Um, so, so we begin with a seven county forecast for okay. population employment growth that includes areas to the north of the river. Um, but um, so picking up on that, 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 um, that mention of, of where people work and live, it's, it's complex and right. adding land in one spot doesn't mean that the people will choose to both live and work in that spot. Um, you know, we were recently looking at, at some census data and about 112,000 people that live in Clark, in, in Clackamas County rather, uh, work in a different county. About 112,000 people that live in Multnomah County work in a different county. About 112,000 people that live in Washington County work in a different county. Uh, so we make complex decisions about okay. where we live and where we work. We don't pick the job that's closest to where we live. We don't pick the house that's closest to our job. Right. We have two income households. Uh, so we try to coordinate to the extent we can with Clark County. Uh, and, and that begins with having a forecast that, that incorporates. And have you seen a big trend within the city of Portland uh, gaining more job growth in terms, I know from a population standpoint with, you know, we've had Christian Kaler, the economist, kind of talk about it, and the first time in our lifetime where it's been the city of Portland that's been kind of the driver on this recovery in terms of population growth and job growth. That's right. I'm assuming those numbers matched in with you. So do you have to make adjustments then saying, you know, looking at that, we're going to be looking at, you know, 20 years ago it was the commute out west. It was, you know, commute into town and then going home. Now it's, it's, it's we kind of got the reverse commute plan now with people coming into the core. Right. And that's, that's definitely something that we've observed as well. And it's one of the reasons why we do this kind of analysis every few years so that we can keep tabs on that and, and adjust accordingly. We're not, we're not uh, bound to the forecast that we come up with now for the next 20 years. Right, we can, you can make adjustments as, right, we've, right. as we've gone through. Right. And is this the first time that the urban growth boundary has not been recommended to expand in this every six years since that, it started? Or That's right. Um, it, so the urban growth boundary was originally adopted in 1979. Okay. And since then, it's been expanded by about 32,000 acres. Um, and this would be if the Metro Council goes with the recommendation that, that's before them, uh, this would be the first time that the urban growth boundary is not expanded when, when it's been uh, up for uh, consideration in one of these legislative decisions. And I would imagine uh, just on the surface if I hear, you know, Port you know Oregon's got the you know, number two in immigration and Portland Metro has, you know, had huge population growth. And oh, by the way, we're not expanding our available land. I mean, we're, we're, what maybe a couple high points of what are the basis on, on yeah. not expanding when on one side we're talking about I hear people complaining about traffic and, you know, again, population growth and, you know, all the millennials want to live here, but then we're saying long term we're not going to expand. I know it's not for, you know, ever, but in the short, you know, kind of what's kind of high level, you know, how do we justify that if I'm talking to somebody? Sure. Yeah. Well, uh, I mentioned the 32,000 acres that have been added to the boundary since its initial adoption. We haven't seen a lot of development in those acres. It's, it's been challenging to, to provide the, the governance, so having okay. a city. That, that is willing and able to govern those areas as well as providing the infrastructure to support housing and job growth. So just taking a snapshot of um, 1998 to 2014, that 16 year period, only about 6% of our new homes have been built in those expansion areas. The yeah. remaining 94% were all in the original 1979 urban growth boundary. That's, that's not only for the reasons I mentioned, the difficulty with governance and finance in, in, um, in expansion areas, but it's also because of the desirability of, of close-in locations. Right. So we could expand the urban growth boundary quite a bit, but I still, I think there's a question there of whether growth would actually go to all those areas. Um, I suspect that we'd still see a lot of growth in our core urban areas right. where you have walkability, um, to grocery stores, to, to the bank, to the doctor's office. Those are things that, that people are 
increasingly putting uh, value on as they're looking for homes and uh, for employers. So these are things that they're looking for when they're thinking about uh, where to locate their offices. The, the days of the, the uh, office park, uh, are, those, are, those are changing. So no, they are. Yeah. I think the whole, just the whole kind of live work is changing completely and we're seeing that in our industry on the apartment side. I mean, the, from the size of units to the number of people in a household, um, how long they stay, you know, single or in those units. And like you said, the desirability of being close to where they work. Uh, and it's really the big thing is the services. Right. I mean, wanting to have those services within walking or transportation or biking. And so you're seeing this continued drive to the core. Right. Um, the question we always have is, you know, like you said, the things that make us great are also, you know, the things that you end up possibly losing as more people come in here. And I know you try to manage that, but I'm sure it's not. <laughs> it's, yeah, I don't envy your position on that one. Well, it's, uh, unfortunately, yeah. It, yeah. we have an elected council that has ultimate yeah. responsibility for that. It's a, a challenging job, though, and, and certainly it requires partnership with uh, cities, counties, uh, nonprofit sector, and, and uh, other organizations to make it all work. Okay. So if somebody wanted more information on this, can they find that on your website? Or That's right. If okay. you, you go to our website, uh, you can find uh, the Urban Growth Report as, okay. as well as the Chief Operating Officer's recommendation that was released today. And then timing of when it goes to council. And the, That's right. Right. Yeah. And we'll put that on our website as well, link to that so you can get information. Well, thank you again for coming. It was very informative. Thank you. And we'll see you again on HFO TV. Our entire office specializes in multifamily real estate, making HFO the largest multifamily brokerage in the Pacific Northwest. Your success is our passion. Build your legacy with HFO. Call 503-241-5541 or visit our website at hfore.com for more information.